So again, Ooh, thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah. So <laughs> the framework has been updated. So this is for those of you that are have not seen this. Um, we had a really ugly version of this that I had made, and then Nicole Huseman made a <laughs> much less, <laughs> a much nicer version uh, that we kind of talked about last time and went with this. Um, so thanks to Nicole for putting this together. Um, we had also made these changes in the University OSPO working group, and I think one of the reactions was this is nice because it's a first slide. This slide number one is something that could be shared internally now, just in terms of kind of talking about things that you may be doing um, inside of your own OSPO. So please feel free to use this document in any way that is suitable for you. Um, I've also, I kind of worked to reduce some of the text around the functions. So internal adoption, education, strategy, community engagement to be a little bit more succinct. They were kind of long for a while there. So I thought that was nice. Um, and then honestly, the content is, is really the same throughout on slides two through nine. So these are things, if you recall, we had kind of talked about like, what are some of the goals around internal adoption or what are some of the goals around say community engagement? And then around each one of those, what are some questions that we could ask um, with respect to those particular things? Um, so anyway, that, that's really the update. Um, I, if we have time, I'd like to talk about one of these particular goals today, but we'll see how we do. On time. Any questions for Matt on the functions? I, I just want to say it looks beautiful. Yeah, it really does. It does look good. Yeah, I was really happy. Cool. All right. So let's let's keep moving. Um so recently released, it's super exciting, Gary's uh for OSS viability metrics models. Uh, those just went out uh, just in time for us to talk about viability uh, at the member summit, which was which was great. Um, I don't know, Gary, if you have anything you want to talk about about those. Uh, yeah, the um, the metrics models have been a long time coming and have only been possible because of the support of this group. So thank you for being here and helping me and uh, sorting through all of this nonsense that is what this metrics model turned out being. Um, if you're confused by it or it's way too big, please stay tuned for our blog posts that I have now gotten to Verizon Communications. Um, they will groom them and make sure I'm not saying anything I shouldn't, and then I can share it with Chaos and then we can publish them. So the like distilled version of how to use, what, like, what, where to use these things and what they do uh, is coming, but for now the metrics models are up. Awesome, thanks, Gary. Um, the the other thing that we have that just went out is the uh, reflections on the Linux Foundation um, OSS maintainer report. So if you remember ages ago, um, Alyssa had found this report and brought it up in this meeting, and we had a really long discussion about it that we then decided to turn into a podcast with, along with uh, Sophia and Georg and Anita, um, a human as well. So uh, so that went out today. So that was that was really exciting. I don't know, Alyssa, Sophia, if you wanna say anything else about it. Um, yeah, I, I just wanna say I was really, had a really great time recording it. I learned so much from like with fellow like uh, speakers and having the opportunity to read, uh, be encouraged to read a paper multiple times and take notes was actually um, like really useful. <laughs> and that's something I do in my day to day. So um, it was a great time. I'm glad I'm glad we made it happen. Awesome. Thank you. Actually, and I will say this, something that Sophia said, uh, a person who listened to it before it was published was like, Huh, I think we should maybe rethink like um how we think about like end of life of of projects because you know how you said that the maturity was didn't include like actually um uh um sunsetting projects. So um it was it was it actually made like an immediate kind of conversation start from in our in our own space as well. 
Awesome. Those are the kinds of things that we hope to get out of out of doing things like this, right? We all we all learn from it, and we have interesting conversations that uh, hopefully other people find interesting as well. So I would encourage you to to have a look at that, and it goes along with we. We had another podcast about the uh, OSS viability that went out two weeks ago. And then there was another one that was just kind of catching up on what we're doing in the chaos project the, the two weeks before that. So I encourage you to go have a listen to those to the others if you, if you haven't already done that. Um, Remy, you joined just in time because we just got to your agenda item. Do you want me to stop sharing so you can share your screen or do you want me to click on this link, which is easier for you? You can just click on the link. Thank you, Don. Okay. Yeah. So this is a very early version. Uh, this seems like the right kind of crowd to be presenting at. Hi, everybody. I'm Remy DeCosmaker, the open source lead here at the digital service at CMS. Uh, we're starting up an open source program office in the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. And one of the things that we are doing is an inventory of all of our open source projects. Uh, the chaos community has been a really important part of helping to stand up a lot of infrastructure and projects that OSPOs I've been a part of in the past. And today, uh, we are sharing this very early maturity model with five different tiers of projects. So tier zero, the way the spreadsheet works is M stands for mandatory, R stands for recommended, and N stands for not recommended. And each of the columns are a different maturity level of a project. So tier zero is private repo. Tier one is repo that has been uh, outbounded and is a one-time release. Tier two is a project that's sort of like an inner source project, a close collaboration project where you have people working on it together, but maybe not necessarily in the open. Tier three is working on it in the open, but there's no open governance. And tier four is fully open and fully open governance. And we have broken down sort of all of the uh, maturity models based on whether or not certain files exist in a repository. So the, the file license.md, you can see that it has one section called license. It's mandatory in every tier. Uh, if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see we have this thing, you know, a readme file. And a readme is recommended to have the following things in it. Uh, there are a lot of them based on, uh, we use the Justice 40 initiative as one of our open source projects that was released in the past year or two that is particularly mature. Um, obviously, if it's a private repo, uh, it's not going to have governance and it's not going to have feedback. And a glossary is probably a little bit overkill. So you can see that like, not a lot of the readme is really mandatory for a less mature project, but for the most mature project, all of those fields are mandatory. And if you scroll down, you can see files like contributing.md, you can see other files like maintainers and governance, and those really aren't recommended until projects are sort of entering that third and fourth tier, maybe early on in that second tier. So uh, we've been working on this project alongside of the U.S. Digital Response, which is a volunteer organization that helps to do civic development and civic hacking projects. Um, this is early. Uh, we are going to be talking about it more publicly in the near future. But uh, since you folks are deeply steeped in the context of metrics and maturity, I figured we could get away with giving you an early preview, even though the thing isn't fully baked yet. Uh, we have a repository to go along with this. It is still very early on. It is called Repo Scaffolder. Uh, and it is where we are taking all of these recommended files and turning them into templates so that people can say like, hey, I want to start a project. And you're like, great, start by cloning the tier zero project and it'll give you all of the templates for a private repo or oh, you're going to release publicly. Here's our tier three templates. So you can just go and fill these out. And if something is mandatory, it shows up in the repo as uncommented out in the template. If it's recommended, it's commented out so that the project maintainers can know that it's something that they maybe could or should do. And if it's not recommended, we just remove it from the template altogether so that people don't have to fill out that extra thing. And we're still working out the automation of this and having GitHub actions for it so that we can run repo linter and see whether stuff is there and maybe even submit pull requests and issues automatically to projects in the future. Uh, we're really excited about the work, 
but uh, this is under active development. It is still very early on, and we wanted to put it on the radar of this group here just because we know there's a lot of talk around maturity models and metrics that we think you folks would appreciate this project. And that's probably enough time talking, so I will stop there. This is really great. I I really like this. Um, you know, this is something that we all hope to be more organized about, I think, within, within companies and even within organizations, like even within my work within the CNCF Contributor Strategy Group. You know, the CNCF is, we still don't quite have something like this for sandbox incubating and graduated projects. We're trying to get there, um, but it, it's all evolved organically. And so it's hard to come back and and organize something like this. And it's um, so, you know, so I appreciate how much work this has been. And I think this is a really, I think this is a really clear way to present that. I really yeah. like it. We're gonna be presenting this a little bit, maybe if we get a chance at the Intersource Commons Summit next uh, on the 15th of November. So in a couple of weeks from now, but uh, the USDR engagement we're in probably wraps up within two weeks. So we're really hoping to have the scaffolder, the scaffolder repo and the, the docs around it sort of ready within the next month or so. Uh, but happy to, to talk shop with anybody, uh, you know, shout out to CNCF incubating and Apache incubating and all these other places that have their own maturity models. We have been, you know, definitely standing on the shoulders of giants and looking at those as places where we can pull from. So, uh, you know, big shout out to the community sharing their resources. We all, all boats rise with the tide. Cool. Thanks, Remy. Alyssa, you have your hand up. Yeah, I, it might be interesting uh, to hear from like OSPOs about when, when I, like there are kind of key files that I look for when I'm looking at an open source project. And a lot of times it, it, um, like including uh, the license like a document as well as like a con contribution. Like I, I need to know um, if it, this is okay for us to contribute to upstream, like is a CLA required, you know, and and when it comes to uh, sponsorship, like through our FOSS fund, like what are the ways that um, uh, we can engage both like in an engineering capacity, but also like in terms of like donation and sponsorship. And I don't know, it'd be great to, I, I don't know what's above uh, row 28, but I just want to make sure that the recommendations like are also uh, addressing um, that in, that ongoing <laughs> that ongoing anxiety as as like as as, as an awful team looking at like a random you know a random uh, open source project. Yeah, I actually was just in a conversation today. This is really about outbound maturity. But inbound maturity is a whole nother, you know, we're we're hoping that they will be as close as possible to each other so yeah. that we can be working off of the same rubric. But um, things like, does it have, you know, a supporters page and is it sustainable from a community standpoint? You know, all those inbound questions about risk, those are not necessarily reflected in the outbound uh, rubric, but we definitely should be and intend on developing more of an inbound rubric too. So would love to talk I mean, on that sometime. I, I guess what I'm saying is I might be useful to hear here, like what are other people's templates for open sourcing a project? Like we always recommend a code of conduct. Um, I don't know where that's represented here. I'm gonna miss, um, but that that is mandatory across all projects. Yep. Um, as well as the security vulnerability reporting. Yep. Um, yeah. I th I think for us, we're looking at the core infrastructure initiative, uh, the best practices, um, like going for like passing, which includes a lot of the the things that you're mentioning there. Um, Chan, you had your your hand up. Um, I want to say I love this. This is something um that I. I think that's exactly why we have these working groups because it's like for content like this and um, creating these things. Remy, um, 
Thank you so much for for bringing this. How does one um, collaborate with you? Um, how do we get involved and um, contribute to something like this? Um, so, for example, we I, I recently opened up kind of a, a gig in our marketplace to have someone update our repo linter, but instead of having them update our repo linter, they could potentially just work on a repo linter with you all based on this model, um, how could people get involved? Yeah, I mean, we're still pretty early on, but the repo scaffolder URL that I posted there, uh, you can follow that repo and star it. And that's where we're going to be doing a lot of our uh, uh, development work in the future. Uh, it is still like very, very early on. We, we're going to cut a final release probably within the next two or three weeks. And that's where like, hey, we have ideas for templates or you should use this thing. This thing will become our, our source of truth in the future. Um, but if you want to talk shop, this is my email address. And, you know, happy to, you know, get more specific. Uh, we also have an alias uh, open source at where you can reach us. Um, happy to talk shop anytime. Cool. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Okay, Gary, you had your hand up. Yes, I did. Sorry, it took me a second to find lower hand and mute. Um, I wanted to kind of poke on the naming here of tier zero through tier four. Um, do you think that that's what you want to stick with over time? Or do you think that there's like different delineations of where tier zero and tier four work that makes sense outside of like a readme or a reference document? Because it, reading this right now, I think I, I know naming is very hard and it's probably not your top priority, but I'm, I'm just I'd like to poke you on that. Yeah. Um, Don, if you click on maybe it's called like tears, the uh, tears page or whatever. Yeah, so there is a name for tier zero. It just, oh, okay. yeah, so, you know, static repository is the name of that one. Uh, transparent is the, you know, one-time release, I think is where we're going to land with that. Close collaboration for tier two. Tier three, I think is uh, public repo. And then tier four is open source community. So they have names. We just aren't using them in that spreadsheet. But I, based on that feedback, I think we should change the spreadsheet right now. Yeah, because it, th this, I think, makes it a lot more intuitive uh, for me as like trying to consume what should go where and when I need particular files in the repo. I think that would help a lot. Yep. Awesome. Cool. Thanks for the feedback. Sure. Thanks, Gary. Uh, Matt, you've got your hand up. Yeah. Uh, this is super cool, Remy. Thank you. This is like getting over the like throwing some code over the wall issue, you know, like kind of monitoring that a little bit um on your don could you bring up the repo scaffolder github yeah so on the templates remy could you click yep. on the templates have you and then maybe just pick like tier two or is i'm sorry tier zero you i'm sorry Have you thought about um, how you might provide templates for people as well as guides? We've, because we've done this before where we've had a markdown file that had kind of all the things we need. And we were trying to tuck guidelines into that template as well. And it got really, the, the document itself got really complex and didn't help people. And we ended up splitting them apart as like template.license.md and guide.template, or I'm sorry, guide.license.md, yeah. just to help people kind of navigate through the base files that they need that have kind of no information in them, and then yeah. a guide as to how they might think about filling it out. Yes, uh, we have thought about this, and we chose a tool called Cookie Cutter uh, in the Twitter OSPO in the olden days, uh, where I did some work in the past. We use Cookie Cutter as sort of a choose-your-own-adventure command line tool, where mm -hmm. we would ask projects like, What's your repo URL? What's your contact email address? What's your Slack support channel? Okay. And then it populate all of those templates. And that's what like this slug you see here for project statement, there's a command line companion for it that says like, 
what's your project statement? And then you can put it in and then it will just populate all those things. But if you wanted to do it manually and do your own find and replace, here's the template you can use by yourself too. So that's how we're approaching it. Um, There will be a lot of complexity that comes along with it. Yes, that's the upstream cookie cutter. And uh, we're working on... uh, hooks and actions and hooking into repo linter. There's still a lot of like putting the pieces together stuff. We've split the project into two teams. So one team is focusing on the templates themselves and making sure that they reflect reality. And then the other team is working on automating that. So building the command line tools and the repo linter stuff around it. So okay, that's how we got it split up right now. Cookie cutter has served well in the past for this, but we also want something that's like, Some people are going to want a GitHub template repo that they can just fork and, you know, fill it out themselves. Some people know what they're doing. Yep. So we're going to have sort of three options, right? Here's the static files by themselves. Here's a template repo in GitHub. And then here's a command line tool that will generate all this stuff for you. Okay. Right on. Cool. Thank you. Yep. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, Remy. Uh, Let's see. We'll move, go ahead and move on, on the agenda. Uh, Quick reminder that Chaos takes a meeting break in December and January. So I think we've decided on December 11th through January 8th, which I'm a, a big fan of to give people a little break while they're busy, busy over the holidays. I don't know, Elizabeth, if you wanted to add anything or Matt. Just that I have not updated the Chaos calendar yet. So they're still on there, but they will be deleted shortly. <laughs> as soon as possible. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks. Um, ChaosCon, we're super excited. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth, for doing a bunch of work to actually get the registration and the schedule made available online. So that uh, that's super helpful. It is February 1st, which is the Thursday before FOSDEM. Uh, registration costs $10, so it is extremely affordable. Uh, that's mostly just to defer some of our costs for the for the hotel and food. And so you can get links to registration, links to more about the the conference. And then as always, we are looking for uh, sponsors so that we can, you know, pay for things like like food. Um, So if you're interested in talking about sponsors, sponsorship opportunities, you can talk to Matt. There's also a link on the, to a sponsor prospectus on the chaos website itself. Um, I can say that we're super flexible and the sponsorships are super affordable. So we're we're happy to work with you to find something that that meets your needs if you're interested in in helping us out a little bit. Anything anybody wants to add about ChaosCon? I I will say we have um we're thinking about kind of afternoon unconference. I don't know if that would be worth bringing up here if anybody would have an interest in something like that. Yeah, historically we've split um, we split the group into kind of two areas. So there's like a deep dive on Augur and a deep dive on Grimoire Lab. So we're still going to do that. Um, so for people who are interested in diving deeper into the software, we'll certainly have those two tracks. Um, but we've what we've found is that not everybody wants to dive into using the software. Maybe they're already familiar with it. They've got a workflow. They don't they don't really need the deep dive, or maybe they're not particularly um, interested in I don't know, in a deep dive about software in general. So the idea was we'd create a third breakout so that um, other people would have would have some interest. And we've had a few discussions um, on this topic about, you know, do we define the breakout topics in advance? Do we do an unconference where people can come and, you know, define the stuff that they're they're interested in doing? So I'm I'm curious about people's a few people's feedback is are the breakout sessions is that something you'd be interested in doing instead of some of the software and if so does anybody have any thoughts on how they'd like to see that structured did that cover matt that was the question you were asking yeah okay anybody have any thoughts i'm curious about thoughts from people who've been chaos con before so i'm gonna i'm gonna look at brian here because brian's been to quite a few chaos con do you have any thoughts on how a, how we could structure like a breakout or an un, un, would it be better to do it as an unconference session kind of in parallel to the auger and grimoire lab track do you have any thoughts 
I mean, I've never really done an unconference. I, I like them. The like, honestly, when you said that, I was thinking, are we still doing it in the same hotel conference room? Yeah. So that space. Or, or, or wait, are we wait? No, we did it in a new place last year, didn't we? Well, yeah, it was the yeah. This Bedford. isn't this isn't the 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 Ebus. This is um the Bedford. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. that that would and, work. I think I, you you were kind of already there, um, last year anyway, because you kind of, the way you spaced everybody out and did that. Um, so there's certainly enough space there. Um, I think, yeah, as long as it were somewhat time boxed and guided. I think yeah. that would definitely work because we get a lot of informal, like for me, the value of chaos con, the sessions are great, but I get a lot of value out of the informal conversations that we have. Yeah. So even if it's a, you know, hour or 90 minute session of, yeah, here, here are potential topics. Everybody grab a topic and, you know, rally around it you know like i've seen that done before you just grab a piece of paper off of a board and just say i want to talk about this you know and everybody goes and talks to that person and if nobody does and yeah so that that's a way to do it i don't need to get in the weeds on that but no i think fine. that would be valuable is the short answer no. okay Cool. That's helpful. Does anybody else have any opinions, thoughts? I haven't been to ChaosCon, uh, but I do have some experience with unconferences, um, but they've always been the, the kind of a lightning format, uh, lightning talk uh, style where it's just a blank board with time slots written down and it's first come first serve and you write down your topic and your title or your name and then you come back at your time and you plug your laptop in and you go. And that's been really, uh, it's been really fruitful because it comes up with a, you end up with a, a mix of people who have not necessarily felt confident to present elsewhere before because it's a shortened period of time. They can, they don't have to go through a CFP process. So I found as a conference organizer, it's really helpful to encourage people to participate. Um, and you get a really wide variety, a diverse group of like talks by the end of the day, looking back at the schedule, it's it's pretty phenomenal, just the range of, of information that, that gets shared. So that's my only comment on that. Cool, thanks Tabitha. Nigel. Yeah, another model that I've seen work well for the unconference in addition, or in uh, like another option of, instead of first come first serve, we often will have like a board put up at the beginning of the day for people to write topics and then sticky you notes know, for people to vote. And then like around lunchtime, like the topics with the highest votes get slotted in. And so like there's a there's a uh, you know, it's a little bit less like or a little bit more about like what people are interested in, like coming in to talk about as opposed to, you know, who got there first. Yeah, that's a really good point. And that so I've I've actually facilitated a lot of unconferences um in the past. And and that tends to be my my preferred model because the the other thing you can do, you can let people vote on the sessions. And then um, what, what that allows you to do is at the end, you can have a couple of people who can then also combine and dedupe because there's usually some that are pretty similar that you could really, really combine a little bit. And then it also gives you the flexibility to make sure that, you know, two really similar topics aren't in the same time slot and you can, you can move, move things around. So that, yeah, yeah, I, I agree. That would probably be that would probably be the way we would do it. We'd put up a board at the beginning of the day and let people start start putting their ideas down and then and then kind of organize it a little bit afterwards. Cool. Um, the other, so Matt, earlier, sorry, you just went off video, so hopefully you're still, yeah. still there. Um, probably dressing his dog. <laughs> Because Matt had said that he wanted to come back to something if we had more time on the agenda, um, which it looks like it looks like we do. Um, while we wait for Matt, does anybody have any agenda items that you want to talk about at the next meeting on the 16th? Anything you want me to to reserve some space on the agenda for?
Okay, um, that's that's fine too. Uh, you can also this is this is one of those meetings that anybody can add stuff to the agenda. So if you think of something um, in a couple of days or next week that you want to add to the agenda, feel free to just uh, just do that. Um, and feel free to if I haven't created the the template for the next week, feel free to do that and just add your add your agenda items there. So that's that's totally cool. You don't have to to wait for me to get organized. Uh, Matt, you're back. You you went off video. I called. I on did. You. Somebody you knocked there. on my door. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no uh, so we, we reached the end of the agenda and we do have time. So you said you wanted to get to circle back on something um, related yeah. to the functions, yes. I think. So mostly it was, so I'm, for all of you, I remember how I have said that I'm working on that to-do book chapter. So this has been a slow, slow process, um, but I'm slowly framing it around um, this that we have here. And so I was hoping maybe you could all just I could rely on some of um, the really smart people who are on this call to take a look at one particular area of this model, which is let's see the upper right corner, which is community engagement and then upstream. So I'm what I would like to know, and you can just like say whatever's on your mind, like what are the challenges that you have in as, or, as an organization when thinking about working in the upstream? So as an example, um, a challenge could be that you want to work in the upstream, but the project that you want to work with is dominated by a single organization. And contributing to that upstream project could, could really pose a real challenge for you. So that was just to kind of set the stage. So I'm wondering if there are other, when you're thinking about and, and, big, yeah. As, and where would you put like that example? Where would that go? Would that be like community engagement or... It Are would be community them? engagement and upstream. So I'm just trying to identify like what challenges you all might have because that'll help lead to kind of metrics that we could over use to, to understand those challenges and perhaps overcome them. So I'm just trying to understand from you all what some of those challenges might be. I'm happy to, to go first. If... Yeah, you just just talk out loud. Talk about <laughs> challenges like... Yeah. Did you just say a complaint fest? Um, yeah, just complain. So, complain about first working of all, in the I upstream. Have to, I have to wake up and have to go into the office, and that's hard. <laughs> and then, <laughs> um, no challenges. Um, the the challenges in this site in this circle. Um, I think what you brought up is actually quite an important one. You know, like and how how, um, but I I. I'll take another step back. I think there are like two parallel challenges for upstream um, engagement and contribution in projects. One is like the per the pr process, the internal processes that like the OSPO really has to be like your partner in and like, you know, getting through and making sure this is an appropriate um, project to to contribute to so doing those checks and 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 really having access to understanding like in a, in a consistent way like what is the license what is the contribution guidelines like and being able to like to scan um, a project and understand that like very quickly without doing like a lot of, of review because you're not the expert and nor do you have like the time to do that for every review and then um, and then passing that over to the let, like all the other types of reviews that need to happen in order for somebody to be approved for upstream contribution. But then I, I think what's more strategically the challenge is the like getting the okay, the procedural okay, or like kind of clear challenges, but actually supporting people to be real ongoing and like good like uh, citizens in the open source community. I feel like that is like the the, the most important and potential of people's engagement in open source and also the like the most the most challenges and the more disparate challenges like show up there. And so um, I find that uh, that's where both documentation and education happen a, a lot, you know, um, where I, I'm I've been trying to rely more on like the potential of mentorship because that's like at least one way to like scale you know, it doesn't make sense to scale yourself, especially when you don't have necessarily any real insight into how a community works. But I, I, um, 
I I feel like those those and, and even trying to design programs like of like how to have to incentivize people engaging over like this one fix that they want to make or this one like quick engagement, like really have like incentivize why people would want to engage uh, for both their professional career and because it's like um, a, a like the, the the right thing to do in a more sustainable way. Those are my those are some of my challenges. Thank, thank you. I've been typing this out, so thanks. I, one other challenge that I find, and this isn't necessarily represented here, is that I feel like there's a big, um, like, I, I can't really, like, understand the two, but, like, I feel like there's, like, a lot of interest and excitement to open source projects, but, like, not necessarily get engaged in, in open source projects. And so I almost feel like, and, and I feel like I'm trying to understand, like, why you would want to open source a project and people don't even have any experience being in an open source project, you know? So um, that's been like one of the, that's been one of my challenges. Does that make sense? I hope it makes sense. Yeah. yeah, it does. People hear, people read about uh, open source on NPR and they want to create an open source project. Yeah. And I, and I think, it, I think it's something I, we want to support. Like, I feel like it's a place where people are excited about their work. They want to share, you know, it keeps people innovative and engaged. Like, I don't want to be like, a, you know, like the, I don't want to be the, the wet noodle in the room, but, but I, I just, I, I would like for the people who are very much engaged in the project to be like, we want to add this to Python rather than like make this other thing. Um, having had no experience in any open source community. So that's a challenge. It's just like getting people involved in open source. And Nigel, you had your hand up and it went right back down. Did you still have something or are you? Well, I saw I saw in the comments, like someone was essentially saying, the Sophia is saying the same thing, like time and prioritization. Like I was saying, like making the business case, you know, it's hard a lot of times for, uh, to get protected time for engineers to be able to to work on stuff inside the organization. Yeah, for Even, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, Gary, you got your hand up. Yeah, absolutely. So one one of the um uh, my my favorite quote around the topic of getting people involved in open source is that like open source projects should be a bridge in that they are very cumbersome to put up and you would only ever put them up because you need a way across the river. Like you need to maintain it. You need to be kind of committed to it in the same way that you commit to building and maintaining a bridge. And I think like creating that culture is really hard because there is either a culture of don't open source anything or yeah, let's open source this thing that we wrote because wouldn't it be cool to do open source? And very rarely do we have teams that understand the culture of like, okay, when you put something in open source, there is a lot of nurturing that you have to do. It's not like free labor that people will come back and just contribute to your project because it also solves their problem. Um, they won't find it. They won't know about it. They won't know what it is if there's not some like governance structure or strategy or care put into maintaining it. And and uh, even just using a template of all of those guidelines would be a step forward for a lot of um, projects. So I just kind of wanted to tack onto that, that I think it is a commitment and it is definitely a problem that I have seen frequently that folks will want to open source something but not know what they're getting into. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Gary. Um, Alyssa. Yeah, uh, you know how um, the Linux Foundation has been using or, or leveraging the conversation around the license changes um, about the import uh, from like an open license to a BSL license. Um, I think it's an opportunity for, for foundations generally, and I think the Linux Foundation is doing a really nice job about this, being like, this is why foundations matter. Like, that we're not just talking about code here, we're also talking about open governance. And I, I think that this is an opportunity for us to be like, we're not just like the open source program office where we switch like and make code available. You know, this is like, are you 
ready to like build a community with open gover governance. And I'm not sure that like we're um, in the process of open sourcing projects, we're always like keeping in mind that it's not just about the code, you know? So, so I'm much more excited and, and, and willing to like excited to support like uh, teams that are very, very already involved in open source that want to open source a project because they see something missing in the space and they want to build upon like an already existing um, ecosystem than the ones that uh, have like a, a new idea that are having the, an open source project be their way of understanding open source. And I want to be supportive of both, but I'm more excited, you know, in, in limited amount of time, more excited to support the ones that um, are already engaged and understanding the dynamics of what it means to make a successful and sustainable open source community. Hand down. I'm off my pedestal. Thank you for my <laughs> TED talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Alyssa. Uh, Tabitha, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I was going to say something along the same lines of what Alyssa was pointing at is within uh, our organization, it, it's it's very exciting to think about publishing a new open source project and we have some structure and, and guidelines internally as far as like, why do you want to open source? And why are we putting company resources to this? What's your goal? Understanding like the intention of this project in, does it fit into the, uh, the broader open source ecosystem? Asking those questions early on and getting it, and encouraging our engineers to think uh, about that. So we're not, we're putting out our best open source projects, not just whatever happens to be done uh, has been helpful. Uh, though it has taken, a, it takes a lot of education to to get somebody as Alyssa's pointed out, if you've never worked in open source and don't understand that, you know, building, it requires building a community. Um, it, it can be very difficult to, to bridge that knowledge gap and to sort of, you don't want to calm their excitement down about their project because they're finally excited about open source. But at the same time, it's, let's, it's a requirement to be a bit more deliberate and be able to help them make the business case as to why it because it, it's helpful for them to be able to protect their time with their managers too, to say, hey, this is actually a strong business case for us to, to promote this open source project or to publish this, uh, if they understand the uh, economics of open source in their own businesses and their own organizations. So that's been a challenge for us. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm just gonna plus one that because that's been a challenge at a couple of the companies that, that I've I've worked in is really, really having those discussions early and getting people to open source things for the, for the right reasons and the stuff that doesn't really need to be open source uh, probably should be. And that, those are hard conversations to have. Okay, so we have two more minutes. Matt, did you get what you need? Do you have this any other fantastic. questions for people? This is fantastic. I just, I love, <laughs> love the feedback that you all provide. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, Remy. Remy, yeah, go for it. Just wanted to plug CLA as a common barrier, just to mention out loud. What is, did you say? Uh, contributor license agreements. Oh, uh, that's so funny. <laughs> I, I know see. that we've had to keep track of those in other OSPOs, and it typically is a, a barrier to upstream contribution, especially if they have lawyer agreements and patent clauses, et cetera. Yeah, it's a huge barrier for some some big companies. Um, not to mention any names. There's one particular company that requires like the the CLAs to be signed on on paper, and it was a it was a challenge for us uh, at VMware to work work the process around this this company that had a very specific requirement for all legal docs being signed by their CTO um, on paper. Uh, which I, th I think we eventually managed to do um, because we wanted them to contribute, but it was it was a big it was a it was a challenge. If we just had a DCO process that would have been like a million times easier. Because a lot of companies, right? You're not allowed to. Um, most engineers are not allowed to just click through a legal agreement because you're binding the company. Um, you know, putting yourself in a binding agreement on behalf of the company and not author. Most engineers aren't authorized to do so. So. Yeah, contributor license agreements. Um, they don't sound that hard. So you just got a bot, you just click a thing. But people that work at big companies, it's, it's a big challenge for sure. That's great. Thank you, everybody. And just, I mean, maybe to clarify that point a little bit, because 
from what I understand, there are corporate contributor license agreements, like individual corporate license agreements, and a challenge is trying to like distinguish the two and understanding what um, engineers are empowered to do and what we have to like escalate for, you know, essentially the CPO to sign off on. And this is, this depending, it's, it would be, it'd be um, really easy if that was already a flag, very visible where, you know, code is stored so that we could see, you know, we could quickly see what the license is. We can quickly see and have like an established best practice at, at minimum of how to move forward with the um, setting up the, the appropriate agreements. Remy didn't put a comment in the chat, Alyssa, to the... Yeah. Yep. Cool. Um, okay, so we we are out of time, um, but I wanted to thank everybody because we had some really, really interesting conversations. So I wanted to just thank everyone for, for participating and think of, you know, think of agenda topics for, for the meeting in, in two weeks. Feel free to add them to the agenda, send them to me, drop them in Slack, whatever, whatever's easiest for you. And we'll, we'll get your topics on the agenda for our meeting in two weeks. And maybe I'll see some of you at KubeCon. Yes, have a great time. So Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Good to see y'all. Bye.